Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we've got SBE's Educator of the Year with us. Yes, Jeff Welton joins me and Chris Tobin on This Week in Radio Tech, where we're talking about education, how to get it, and how to install and keep a transmitter really happy for years. Today on Twerks. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. And by Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. It's the show where we talk about everything from this here microphone, or maybe your microphone, or somebody's mic, to the light bulb at the top of the tower, which these days could be a strobe light. And a lot of broadcasters these days don't even have towers. They're streaming on the interwebs. Kind of a almost a new thing. It's becoming very popular. Hey, we talk about everything that goes in between those, those things. And today, we've got a great, kind of a two-part conversation with Jeff Welton. We'll bring Jeff in and here in just a minute, but we're going to be talking about, uh, first of all, the the whole kind of the meta idea of broadcast education and how it's different now than it was in the, um, oh, the, the electronic schools, the mail order days, or maybe even going to university for, uh, for a, a double E degree or something like that. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about how that has changed and, you know, what it takes these days to, to be a broadcast engineer uh, from a number of different perspectives. So that's coming up. And then we'll talk about some specifics about uh, transmitters and, and care and treatment, installation, longevity. Uh, this is a, a part of a talk that Jeff Welton gives, and he's got some great, great ideas just because they're so true. And so often people either disregard them or try to skirt around them or take shortcuts and, and uh, uh, uh. Can't do that. I'm telling myself that, too. you got to follow Jeff's advice. So uh, I'm Kirk. I work for the Telos Alliance, and uh, they're sponsoring our studio. And uh, glad to be back from uh, uh, Thanksgiving vacation here in the office and doing the show here from the Telos Alliance studio. And let me bring in now our co-host for the show. For, I don't know where he is today. Uh, it's it's Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Thanks, Kirk. I'm, I'm at the, uh, the home office today. Just taking ah. it easy. Well, I had to take care of some problems that occurred in the bathroom, so the leak has been repaired, and I'm just waiting for the plaster to dry. Other than that, it's been a great afternoon. <laughs> you know, I had, I, I had, um, I had a bathroom thing where I had to fix some some wall board, you know, some some drywall, and uh, man, that get, it was on the ceiling, and oh man, do you get dirty doing that? D- dirty, but I mean, just covered in drywall dust, don't you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's a mess. Well, it's a temporary fix at the moment. Uh, they'll be back tomorrow uh-huh. to pretty it up and uh, do everything cleanly. Well, mine's been a temporary fix for about the last four months, and uh, oh I've got to get back in there with some more mud and, and sand and mud and sand, and, and then we can repaint. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But but every time I do that, I'm going to get you know drywall dust all over. I, I got to pull the tarp out and lay it over all the all the dustables in the in the bathroom and over the toilet and the you know the floor and the tub. And get well, just make sure you're wearing eye protection and respiratory protection. You'll be good. That's a good point. That's a good point. Should do that. Oh, small I think detail. I did that the first time. <laughs> yeah, I think I coughed for a couple of days. That pretty well took care of it. Not the smartest. <laughs> so, so Chris uh, Jeff Welton's our host. He's been on before, and uh, Jeff, welcome in. You're in your home office as well, I think, right? I am. I'm hiding in the basement and having a good time. <laughs> You and I got to talk uh, earlier, and you were you were up in the kitchen, and it was it was good to see Jeff Welton's kitchen. Well, and a lot of that's been uh, home brewed. Uh, so I, I do a few home projects. Uh, the basement, I have to claim. I, I guess the the teenager did most of the heavy lifting, and I just supervised. But, <laughs> well, that's nice. But if there's a, if there's a power tool to be used, I'm all over that. <laughs> Actually, I got kind of a funny thing today. Um, I uh, I've been doing some work in in the shop uh, here in in the basement, and this when we bought this house, uh, it came with a vice, you know, a standard bench vice uh, attached to a shelf. But I, I never in, in living here fourteen years, I have never done anything with that vice. So yesterday, I had a need, a need to use the vice, and I discovered that the vice is. Horribly rusted. It barely moves in and out, and it doesn't have enough, you know, um, jaw width. 
uh, you know, uh, snatch to, uh, to, to grab what I had to grab. And so uh, I got to buy a vice. So what did I do? I got in the car. This is why I was late getting back. I got in the car and went over to Harbor Freight, everybody's favorite, you know, tool warehouse. Cause I figured I'd, you know, save some money and, and buy a vice at Harbor Freight. I mean, how bad can you mess up a, a, a vice? So I, I went <laughs> there and I'm, I'm going to give the lady a little bit more credit than she's due. I said, hi, uh, I'm looking around. I need a new vice. And she said, have you tried drinking, smoking, or gambling? <laughs> <laughs> then she said, front of aisle six near the cash register. <laughs> okay, great. That's awesome. I probably use that line the rest of the night. <laughs> that's And that's probably all it's good for. <laughs> I need a new vice. <laughs> Yeah, gambling, drinking, smoking, and loose women. So there you go. Hey, welcome into our show, Jeff. We're going to get underway here in a minute with Jeff, and we're going to talk a, a bit about you know the meta conversation of education, and and that has to do with Jeff's uh, recognition by the Society of Broadcast Engineers for Educator of the Year. And then we'll get into some uh, some good gory details and sage advice, and maybe even a war story or two about uh, transmitter installation and how to protect from all the various ills that can be set transmitters in their operation. Our show This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Angry Audio. Let's roll the tape and talk about Angry Audio for a second about this, this cool uh, uh, gadget, or is it a gizmo? I'm not, not sure. It is the um, uh, it is this thing that's called the uh, Talk Show Gadget from Angry Audio. You know those little live audio mixers? You see them everywhere. Some are so good, you may be tempted to use one in a radio studio. Sadly, they are missing, you know, some of the necessary features that, until now, have only been available on expensive radio consoles. Well, enter the Talk Show Gadget. The Talk Show Gadget adds essential broadcast features to your live mixer, like a studio monitor, volume control, and a second input for listening to your air feed. Your monitor speakers will mute automatically to prevent feedback when any mic is live. And speaking of live mics, the talk show gadget even provides logic to illuminate the on-air side, hopefully hushing the hallway chatterboxes. LED push buttons come on so you can get, uh, and it can have to four microphones, so you can get the right mix, and leave the faders right in their places. Check it out at uh, angryaudio.com. It's the talk show gadget from Angry Audio. Sure appreciate Angry Audio's sponsorship of this week in Radio Tech. All righty, let's jump right into it. Jeff, uh, SBE Educator of the Year. You know, I'm on the board of SBE, and I kind of forget that they have they have this award. And I know Wayne Piscina uh, has been awarded this, and he's a great educator, talks about a lot about IT and IT security. Um, was this a surprise to you? How did how did you find out you got Educator of the Year? All right. Well, first, yeah, it was uh, a huge surprise because the other day where uh, it, it's a fine, fine line when you're in sales between having a sales pitch for your product and talking about something not sales oriented. And I've been lucky with the tech support background that I can just, you know, roll along and uh, talk about how not to blow stuff up and how I did blow stuff up and hope somebody learns from that. So uh, I've been really fortunate that way. And Nautel's been really good about letting me roam free and uh, pretty much do whatever it is I do. So I, I just basically go out and have a lot of fun. And I, I never really, I guess, thought about it as educating at all until uh, Jason called me, Jason Arnellis from SBE for the education uh, board. Yeah. Uh, and Jason said, uh, Hey, um, you've been selected for this. And, uh, I've been presenting for 20 some odd years. I, you've talked to me before. I'm not really all that shy. I think it's the first time I've ever been, <laughs> it, first time I've ever been speechless in my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when talking to, to Jason or when accepting the award? Cause I think you talked accepting the award. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I uh, I did give a little uh, little presentation or a little speech there, and uh, yeah. I mean, what I summed it up to, and and actually, when you and I spoke yesterday, I found the same thing, was that uh, you and I were talking about uh, VPNs, and I learned some stuff that I didn't know, and you learn something from everybody you talk to. Everybody, everybody in this industry knows something that somebody else doesn't know. You're, 
uh, I just figure our mission should be to find that person that doesn't know and teach them the little bit we do. You know, I, I, I kind of wonder about uh, engineers and their education nowadays. Now, so many engineers, so many broadcasters um, need IT people, and they need they need more and more of them. And this came up in a, a big talk we had at the uh, AES convention. Um, uh, both Gary Klein and uh, Chris Tobin talked about this topic of of needing IT people, and uh, uh, well, we, we can talk about you know the pluses and minuses there. I, of course, it's great when a broadcast engineer goes in and gets the IT education. But let's talk a bit about how how we got educated here, and we'll see you know if uh, our audience, you know, you listening at home, uh, you can compare what you did. It used to be that we'd go to some kind of formal school, and plenty of broadcast engineers have been to formal school and have degrees of one kind or another. Now, sometimes it may be in political science, but you had a big interest in broadcast engineering or electronics. Uh, Chris Tobin, give us the elevator speech on your electronics and broadcast engineering education. How'd you get ready for your first job? Well, uh, let's see. Um, it started out with uh, building transmitters from uh, uh, surplus army equipment that was available on Canal Street in New York City or Cortland Street back in the day. And it was also just tinkering, doing a lot of uh, just playing around, figuring out stuff and asking the question why things do what they mm -hmm. do and trying to mimic what I was, what I enjoyed, which was broadcast station. So I built um, a compressor from a uh, Lafayette AM FM receiver by using uh, sort of what they call the wheat bulbs, you know, the little, little light bulbs and a CDS cell attached to each other on the tape in and outputs on the receiver. Believe it or not, it makes for an interesting soft knee compressor. Worked well. Uh, and then peak limiting, we played with, uh, I played with the diodes, discovering there's a certain thing called bias that's required to make it right for the composite. And then I found out that pinching the pilot was not something you're supposed to do legally. I was like, okay, mm. can't do that. And then after that, it was just self-taught all the way through. My first job was literally, a friend of mine was the, uh, the midday guy. The station was looking for a part-time chief engineer to, for the guy who was there who was getting ready to retire. Came up for an interview. I was offered the job at their other station somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. Told them, I said, I'm not interested in doing that. I'd rather be at a station that is an earshot of the major market. And if you're not interested, so be it. I can move on. Left the office. The owner of the company's like, "Wow." A week later, he calls. He says, "Tell you what, we'll give you a, we'll give you a chance. Six months if you make it work, we'll make you permanent." Month seven, I became permanent, and it just wow. moved on from there. Wow! And, and so it's it's been that early interest and in doing a few things yourself and taking enough of that knowledge, and then a lot of on the job training and, and figuring things out while you're while you're getting paid as a you know, as, as, as a junior level guy, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I. I Went to college for a year and a half, two years, and all of the electronics I was being taught, you know, Boolean logic and all this stuff back in the day, it was all for industrial electronics. And I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, but I'm doing something a little different. The discipline wasn't technically, you know, available. It was, you can learn electronics, NAND gates, op amps, and all, you know, all the other different OR gates for the digital stuff. And then the analog basic circuitry was there. But in industrial electronics, it, it stops. It goes to, it takes a, a departure elsewhere. When it comes to RF, in industrial electronics, the RF, high powered RF, is for uh, mechanical equipment, for sealing things, for cutting. <laughs> it's mm. not for broadcasting. So it's yeah. a whole different <laughs> item. So I, I decided to take part-time work at a local college station. They were looking for somebody. So I said, yeah, I could do that. That makes sense. And started picking the brain of the guy who was there and started asking questions. And what I did was, before the internet was available, I just took manuals from everywhere I can find them, broadcast manuals from equipment, and started reading through it, understanding the schematics, calling up the manufacturers and talking to the tech support. And go. So I got this Ampro triple-deck uh, cart machine, and for some reason it does this. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, that's a design flaw, but here's what you can do to get around it. And you just ask the question, so what exactly does that solenoid do? The puck pops up, and how come I shouldn't make it too tight, and it bends or compresses the rubber wheel, and the tape starts to wrap around the cap stand? Yeah, there's, there's a whole process to that. And using an oscilloscope as a, with a trigger to determine the speed and the, the length of the compression of the puck was a technique that I learned from the guys at ITC, Inter you know, International Tapetronics. I was like, yep. what? Yeah, you, you trigger it, you do this, watch the square wave, and look for the trigger, and, and then you'll be able to calibrate the, uh, the, the cap stance, the, the, pull, you know, the I, puck. I, it's exactly <laughs> the same thing for me, Chris, in terms of uh, that early – well, I, I built a few kits, some, some Heath kit and some Radio Shack kits. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and so I, I knew – you know, and I'd read a few little books, you know, some of the little pamphlets or books from – 
from Radio Shack on how resistors work and how transistors work and what an NPN transistor was and a PNP and, and what a 555 timer was. And uh, I built up enough, a little bit of knowledge there, built some kits. And then in, uh, I was always interested in, in you know, broadcast. Well, I, was, I wanted to be on the air. When I was a kid, I, I stuttered terribly. So, of course, I wanted to do what I couldn't do, which was be on the air. So eventually I got over that and got on the air. Discovered I, di I didn't stutter if it was me and a microphone. You know, it was not bad. So, um, uh, but then we had stuff around a radio station that, that wasn't working. And the engineer was nowhere to be found. He was a contract guy and would show up once in a while. And so I, I started reading manuals, just like you, read manuals. And and that was in the day when it seemed like we, well, we didn't have the internet. So if you wanted to fix something, we'd call tech support. That was the only way, I guess you could send a postcard or a letter in, but we'd call tech support. And you mentioned ITC. It was the ITC engineers who educated me on, okay, well, follow this circuit, see what this does, this, then this does this, and this does this, and that pulls the solenoid up. Oh, okay. Bam. There That was, that was like a classroom session right there in, in, in electronics. And, you know, then I had to, you know, read the manuals about re recording bias and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, d just all the stuff dealing with tape and, and hands-on and bam, it, it was there. Now, uh, we're, we're going to hit a couple of the high points of things to read or things that I read that were important to me. Chris, you'd be thinking of a couple of the, the best tomes that you read that made a big difference for you that made the light come on. Jeff, did you have any broadcast or electronics education before working at Nautel? I did. I took electronics. Actually, it, uh, it, I'll try to make a long story shorter, uh, even though that's converse to what I usually do. But uh, <laughs> when I was uh, 17, I was living on a farm in uh, rural Nova Scotia, and there wasn't a whole lot of anybody around or anything. And this slick talking guy came to my high school and said, uh, hey, um, we're doing uh, electronic school in Toronto. Uh, would you be interested? And I said, like, I don't know. Wait a second. Where did you say that was? And he said, Toronto. And I said, ooh, that's a big city. Sure. So I got him to come up, signed up. Next thing I know, I'm taking electronics. Now, prior to that, of course, I had some experience with electronics involving mostly an electric fence and the uh, ignition coil out of a W6 farm hall. Oh, oh. Um, you learn a lot of electronics, a lot about electricity in a farm, but uh, but yeah, it. Uh, if he had been a cosmetology school, I could have been the world's best hairdresser right now, for all I know. So uh, anyway, that that's how I fell into it, and then um, the Nautel job, I applied for that. I'd been doing bench repairs, component level repairs for Radio Shack, working on a cordless phone line, and I said, hey, I know about RF cordless phones are RF. How hard can it be? You know what? When you get into the kilowatts and megawatts, it's a little different. Wow. So you, you mean you, you're the if, if I took a, a, a non-working cordless phone in Canada back to the store and said, this doesn't work, they'd ship it to you and you'd fix it? Anywhere east of Montreal. Yeah, they came into the service depot in Halifax. So we did uh, any electronic, anything that you took back to a Radio Shack store ended up in that depot. And wow. we'd look there and determine whether it was worth fixing or not. And yeah, I mean, some of it's pretty intricate. So it was uh, it was interesting work, and I learned a lot. But uh, uh, it, it was definitely, well, as we've seen with Radio Shack recently, it was probably not a long-term career choice. Well, well, but who, who knew, though? Who knew? Uh, you've got questions, we've got batteries. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, um, mention some of the things to read, and we'll put links to the, whatever I can find uh, on the internet in the show notes. Uh, I'll mention one, and and Chris, you mentioned something too that uh, was really meaningful to you to read. One of the best things I ever read, and I'm going to mention this one because it, it probably won't get mentioned by either of, of you two. Uh, it was less popular, but the, there's an engineer named Jeff Mendenhall. We have yet to get him on the show. I've just got to really try to do that. He's agreed to be on. I just, we've got to, I just got to arrange it. Jeff Mendenhall uh, most recently worked as, and he still may do some consulting for, for Gates Air um, and uh, uh, for the folks who make transmitters there. But Jeff also worked at Broadcast Electronics for quite a while. And when he was there, he wrote several uh, pamphlets, I'd say, I would say white papers that got published in a nice pamphlet form. And one of them was about, um, I don't remember the title of the pamphlet, but it was about the FM stereo baseband and not only how it got made, but how you need to take care of it on its way from the stereo generator into the FM transmitter. And also what could go wrong with things in the transmitter that would end up ruining or compromising the stereo baseband when it was received on an FM receiver. 
And uh, up to that, before I read that, I really didn't understand so well what the bass band did. I knew it had a left plus right in the stereo pilot thing, and somehow the left minus right was in there, and I wasn't quite sure how that worked. But this paper by Jeff Mendenhall, if you look it up, by the way, it's uh, G-E-O-F-F, Jeff Mendenhall. Um, and again, I'll try to put, put it in the show notes. This paper just made the light turn on in my head, like, oh, I understand stereo bass band now. And everything he wrote in there, as far as I know, is still true today. Now, nothing's really changed about that, even in our days of, of now doing things digitally and even carrying a stereo bass band over uh, AES-192. Uh, the, the, the principles, the thing that modulates that, that FM carrier, still the same. Um, so that, that's my favorite paper right there. There are others. Uh, Chris, can you think of a paper that was, has been meaningful for you in your education? Well, I mean, I gosh, I had several papers. I had books. I used to read the uh, Bell Systems Practices books to learn more about basic infrastructure stuff at, back in the day. Uh, my big thing, I, I was taught by folks to learn the workflow of what it is you're, working, you're doing in a radio station or TV. And I have to credit uh, you know, reading a lot of the magazines that back in the day, broadcast, was broadcast engineering, the, the original magazines and, and stuff. And one of the guys was, you read about all the time, it was, his name was Julian Bonathan. And you're like, wow, this guy is overseeing an engineering department. And he's, they, got, they come up with all these ideas of how to cover a, a sporting event or a news event because it didn't exist. It was literally, they were making things that didn't exist to cover events to produce content, right? This is back in like 1980, 1979, the whole bit. And I'm like fascinated by reading these articles. I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. And then there was uh, another guy who got written up on many occasions in, in the magazines as well. His name is Larry Titus. Many of you might know the name. You may know the previous person's name I gave also. And I'd read about the radio station that he was at and the stuff they would do and how they did it and why it was done a certain way. That radio station was WTIC in Hartford. And it was like mm. just fascinating stuff. And I'm like, wow. And you start reading and then I start picking up the books like the uh, NAB Engineering Handbook. I have a 1949 edition that tells you how to tune, or tune uh. how to set equalization with a 111C coil. Okay, uh, it explains all these wonderful things. I also have uh, dozens of the ARL, ARRL handbook that I learned a lot of things from. And it was like, wow, my intended theory understanding. Then one day, a friend of mine who was teaching me a few things, a much older gentleman, well experienced, gave me a book. He says, anything and everything you need to know and understand will get you started with this book. And I'm like, really? He goes, you're working at a station. One of your stations is an AM station. You may want to read this. And it's the Directional Broadcast Antenna book by Jack Layton. I still have it. Oh, I still yeah, have the cutouts. Yeah. I still have the articles cut out from Radio World and somewhere else stuck in it as how to do directional arrays and what they look for and all these things. So that's the kind of stuff. And Julian Bonathan, the guy I mentioned first, he uh, was the guy of overseeing the ABC Television Network's Broadcast Operations Engineering Division. Years later, I'd go to work for ABC in the same building his people were in. And then years after that, I'd go to work for – or before that, I worked for a company that Larry Titus used to oversee. So I, my path took me to people that I read about years earlier and wondered, wondered if I'd ever meet them. And I wound up working mm. with them and learning <laughs> underneath that. And, and from that is where it, everything I do today, I've learned stuff. To learn, how does it go? Yeah, thinking out of the box is, is passe, but asking the question, why? You know, mm. doing this now, why? And understanding that, you know, Jeff knows this because he works with customers all the time. Understanding why the customer is using their product or device in this manner, even though it may go counter to what you designed it to do, mm -hmm. you have to be willing to ask the question, so tell me, what gave you the inspiration to take my box and do that with it? I know it's working and I understand what you're doing and why it's stressing the components, but tell me more. <laughs> and that's the one thing that today people I've met and worked with on projects, they do not ask. I've worked with a, I worked with a guy recently, no, well, a year ago. He was called in to build a studio and needed help. So I said, yeah, I'll come help you build a studio. Textbook, 1980s design. This is how it works. This is the microphone position. This is what you do. This is what you put in it. I said, you do realize that that's going to go counter to what these guys are going to do in this talk show. No, no, this is the way you do it. This, this is the way it's set up. This is the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Hmm. I did it. I wired up, did everything. And then you know, months later, the phone call came. Can you help us make some changes? And that's, it was just like, wow. And I learned, it's like, this is so true. So those are the things that helped me to where I'm at. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff, but those guys. And then, as I think a friend of mine once told me, he goes, how do you know about audio processing the way you do it? And I was like, there are two people in my life that gave me inspiration. Very young age. One of the gentlemen's name is Mike Guadati. I think he's mm -hmm. still in oh, Philadelphia yeah. for iHeart. Yeah, yeah. And then Paul Sanchez here in New York City. 
Those wow. two guys, yeah. oh, I would just visit them at their radio station. I'm like some you know, young whippersnapper. What do I know about stuff? And I ask them questions. They look at me like, no, that's not how it works. Let me show you. And the things they showed me and how they explained it was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> not even in any book. Not, no, that one book. All I know is Mike would always say, look, if you can make it sound good to Madonna's songs, I'll tell you which songs you use, then you're, you're going to be in the ballpark. I'm like, okay, okay, got it. That's when I learned about Jelly, Benitez, uh, Jelly Bean Benitez, who is the mixing engineer for Madonna and why mm. things were done the way they were done. And I was like, oh, okay. And then uh, you know, Paul was also was like, well, here's what you got to do and understand. This is why you want to do it this way, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I get it. And then it was oh, one other person I have to credit is Steve Natt. He passed away many years ago. And he gave me a – I still have it. He wrote a little sketch, a schematic on the back of a napkin. How to reduce the overshoot in a Texar prism. This is when the Texar prisms and the Orban uh, Optimite 8100 combination was real popular. Yeah. He goes, this is what you need to do. Here's why there's a problem. He goes, it's not a design flaw. It's just the way the design works. And I'll never forget it. And that's when I started researching LDRs and not using them in compressors. That was, uh, a, that was a popular uh, thing. Yeah. So, so uh, these are the things you have to, you have to ask. Quite, this is not in any book. I can tell you right now, you're going to find this in any book. You could go to school all you want. You're not going to find this stuff. This is real practical out there in the field. We'll put a link uh, to a couple of things about Julius Barnathan. Uh, and you're right. He, he a big time guy with ABC. He actually passed away 21 years ago tomorrow. So he's yes. been gone, gone for a while. Uh, uh, let, Jeff, uh, you know, I, I, it'd be obvious for you to say, hey, the, my favorite tome, my favorite thing to read is the, the, the thing at the back of the Nautel manual about lighting protection. And if you said that, <laughs> that would be great. But maybe you've got that and something else. Well, I, I have read that one maybe once or twice, maybe 30 <laughs> or 40 times. Uh, there are a couple of other ones that, that just made some things click for me, and, and I tend to reference them in my presentations here and there. Uh, one of them was a book written, and I want to say it was by Carl T. Jones, but it might have been Carl Smith. I can't remember, and I'm sad that I'm forgetting this. But he wrote it around about 1958 on op optimizing directional AM arrays. And it was just a 30-page paper. You can, if you really hit Google hard enough, you might find a PDF copy of it online somewhere. But it was the thing that made it click to me that an antenna system is just a glorified speaker. And that the bandwidth of the antenna system and the linearity of the antenna system will have everything to do with how far your signal goes and how good it sounds. Mm. And so that, that was a real, I call it a, a blue sky moment for me that, uh, you know, oh, so all we're dealing with here is really high frequency audio when you get right down to it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that pay, and it's like I say, you'll find something in a paper that just makes something that you kind of sort of knew, but it really makes it click like it, well, what you were saying earlier. Um, one of the other ones, and I've actually got a copy right beside me which is scary, but uh, Dave Maxson's Eibach handbook. Um, a, oh. lot of that, uh, a lot of that technology has changed as the HD radio technology has advanced, but the fundamentals of it uh, really helped to connect the dots for me in a lot of cases. And I think the other one, because I'm primarily an RF and transmitter guy, so you know this low frequency stuff is a little more mysterious to me than the RF. <laughs> um, I think one of the other ones that, uh, that you may be somewhat familiar with, it's called Audio Over IP. Yep, yep, by Steve Church yeah. and Skip Peasy. Exactly, that's a, and I've that's got, a good one. got a copy of that in my bookshelf right to my left. I do as well. I do as well. Uh, Church Peasy, uh, let's see, IP Audio. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well. That's, that's still, yeah, that's available for Kindle download, actually. Wow. Okay. Uh, good. Good at suggestions. A couple others that I would uh, I would mention very quickly is the um, the information at the back of the Orban processor handbook, uh, the first uh, version of that uh, written by Bob Orban. I'm, I'm sure any updates were too um, about uh, maintaining audio quality in the broadcast studio. And of course, the first version talked about cart machines and uh, and turntables, but it's been updated since then. But great information there there about maintaining uh, broadcast quality. All right, we'll put all those in the show notes. Hey, we are halfway through our show, and that means in the second half of our show with Jeff Weldon and Chris Tobin, we're going to talk specifically about some of the things that Jeff talks about, the high points of Jeff's presentations to SBE meetings and uh, NS workshops and to customers, uh, anybody that he's trying to 
uh, it, that's interested in making their uh, transmitter uh, work better, last longer, and uh, work correctly. So we'll get to that in just a minute. This week in Radio Tech, episode 421, uh, coming to you live from the Telos Alliance Studios. It's brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store. And at Broadcasters General Store, they represent the ever loving Vox Pro. I think they're up to version 7 now. It's an amazing device. And if you've got phone callers on the air, you need a Vox Pro. <laughs> Scott Feibusch here at Wheatstone at NAB, and one of the attractions of the booth is one of the masters of the Vox Pro. Caden's here. We got the Vox Pro 7. Yeah, this the new Vox Pro what 7. What is new? What's exciting? So many new features. Uh, we got a built in, like a mini processor. You can adjust EQs, DSing, almost like a mini production studio. You know, you want to jack up the levels uh, if you got of a low caller. Um, also, we got the Gap Buster, where instead of sitting here on the Vox Pro, if you're an advanced uh, a Vox Pro person, instead of sitting there and editing out all the silence and stuff, basically you hit two buttons and all of that is done for you. Just Ma on. Yeah, it's all about the shortcuts this year. Also, they built uh, FX Macros, which is basically a shortcut button that you establish at the top of your file. And instead of sitting there for two and a half minutes during a song editing, you know, all the ins and outs of the uh, phone call, you can hit two or three buttons and in real time doing it in about 20% of the time. So this is what we're going to see you demonstrating yeah. here. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, last year we went into the hotkey portion and we can get a little bit more advanced and stuff like that. But there's just so much more stuff that uh, is coming out with the Vox Pro 7 here at NAB 2017. I'm going to stand back and watch you do your magic. All right. Vox Pro, uh, one of the sponsors of This Week in Radio Tech, via Broadcaster General Store, where you need to call and get Vox Pro. You can give them a call at 352-622-7700. Uh, They're in Ocala, Florida, Eastern Time Zone, 352-622-7700, or online at bgs.cc, bgs.cc. Chris Tobin, you've worked with a lot of talent who loves Vox Pro. Tell me about it real quick. Oh yeah, yeah. I worked at a stage, several stations where the Vox Pro in the in the early days, I'll call it the early days before pre Wheatstone, if you will, and um, the folks there. We had open reel machines, the, the popular MTR tens, the Otaris. Everybody remembers those, and we used to do so much stuff: razor blades inside the machine, uh, you know, oxide dust everywhere, you name it. Then one day, uh, somebody came in with this. Uh, Vox Pro device, and we're like, hmm, interesting. And it basically was being pitched as an open reel replacement. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Can I shuttle? Can I do this? Can I do that? After the first week, this was the old the old models, which was the uh, serial connection, the whole bit. We had to beat people with a stick because the production studio that had the Vox Pro had a line out the door of the people that wanted to use it to produce elements for their shows. So in short order, in about several months, we had MTR 10s lining the hallway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Vox Pros in, in all, the, all the studios. And it was great. And it was actually, it was a smart, it was a very intelligent approach. They, again, back to what I said earlier, the designers behind it looked at the workflow and said, what can we do to enhance or improve or you know, make it easier, lower the barrier to entry to editing in a fast-paced broadcast environment, whether it be news, sports, or you know, music talk show? And that's what they did. And then you know, Wheatstone comes along and says, you know, we like the idea of what you did. We can probably do it even more because the people we have are just as crazy as the guys who developed it. And now you look at the, the Vox Pro and see, you, know, you can network and you can shuffle, you can shuttle audio files around. You can, I mean, it's crazy what you can do with it. And I think you're limited more by your imagination than anything. But the, the guys at Wheatstone did a great job. And, and as we talk about so often on the show about virtualization, you said it replaced MTR 10s. That were actual purpose built machines. We've replaced them with software that runs on a modern multitasking PC yeah. and a controller that makes it behave well, like what you're used to, like that familiar interface. And and so much of virtualization yeah. is about just that. Well, you got to remember to the MTR tens, the Ataris, those machines, you could go fast forward, rewind, back and forth, paddle your th your fingers, and because of the braking system they had, the dynamic braking, you didn't mm -hmm. snap the tape. Those of yeah. you who may remember the Scully 280Bs, oh, you may remember yeah. the early MPEX 440s, if you pulled that stunt, yeah. yep, you'd have stretch tape. The yeah. MTR 10s, you didn't have that problem, so that's what people loved. When Voxpro comes along and says, we can do the exact same thing, but in electronic form, just imagine how much faster you can do things. That's what happened. <laughs> it's now, today, it's, it's common practice. People are like, what do you mean MTR? What is an MTR 10? Yeah, never mind. Move on. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, we're talking to a man who doesn't know much about stretch tape, but he knows an awful lot about transmitters. Jeff Welton from Nautel, and also uh, honored as SBE's Educator of the Year, is with us uh, as our show continues. Jeff, let's talk about transmitters and your advice about 
installing them and, ma and maintaining them. What, where do you begin that conversation with people? That is a challenge. Um, I mean, the summary is, is three sentences. Keep it cool, keep it clean, keep it well grounded, and almost anything will survive a whole lot longer. I don't care whether transmit or any electronic piece of equipment at all. Um, where I usually try to start is with the analogy to a car. I mean, you, you wouldn't drive your car for 100,000 miles without ever changing the oil. So why do you not do maintenance on a transmitter until it actually breaks? You know, I mean, and every transmitter's got some maintenance issue, even if it's as simple as checking an air filter. Um, the easiest way to do it is just to write a little checklist that may be unique to your own specific situation and transmitter site. I mean, a site with sealed off air conditioning is not going to need an air filter replacement nearly as often as one out with open air cooling in the middle of a cornfield, for example. So a lot of it is always whenever you walk into a situation or a new station, take a look around and figure out what seems to fit best there. And it's going to come down to several things. It's going to come down to manpower availability or person power, however you it's going to come down to budget. I mean, because that does take time. And Let's um, time I let, let, let's uh, spend a few minutes talking about, um, well, I, I don't want to say it this way, but it's a popular book series, FM uh, Transmitter Installation for Dummies. And so <laughs> y you said, you said cool, clean, and well-grounded. Let's, let's cover each one of those things because, yeah, yeah, those are the key things. Why is it important that a transmitter stay cool? Because I, I know there's transmitters operating in hot, horrible environments. I uh, don't know how I like, you know I, I I haven't run one side by side in a cool environment to see what the difference is. But why is it important for electronics to run in a cool environment? All right. Well, statistically, anything with fans, for example, uh, we'll pick a fan. Uh, Electrolyte capacitors have the same spec for what it's worth, um, but. Most of the fans we use have a rating of five-year lifespan. That's expected typical lifespan under zero static pressure. Of course, if you throw back pressure in, it gets worse. But uh, use that five -year 104 Fahrenheit for the metrically impaired. And for every 10 degrees Celsius or 18 degrees Fahrenheit that you reduce that ambient, you double the lifespan. And it's a square law. So at, uh, at um, 30 degrees Celsius, or 104 minus 18, let's add 86 degrees, then your uh, lifespan is 10 years, and at uh, 20 Celsius, or 68 Fahrenheit, your lifespan's 20 years. Oh. So and any fan at all will, will follow that same guideline. may not be the exact same numbers, but the lower the ambient within reason, the longer the fan's going to survive. And again, the same with electrolytic capacitors. We've all seen situations with uh, computer motherboards recently and the, the puppy capacitors. And part of that's cheap, cheap capacitors. Some of it is we tend to forget that computers don't like high temperatures. Yeah, yeah. So, so cool. I, I didn't think about fans. I, you know, I knew about capacitors. Uh, didn't really realize about fans, but I, I suppose you're right. What about um, solid state components? We got to remember that. A, an RF power transistor is is throwing off a lot of heat. Though that's why the fans are there in the first place to blow air across the the heat sinks to get the heat away from that transistor junction. But uh, how how hot is a transistor junction? And and so if I guess if I'm operating if if I'm in a room that's seventy degrees Fahrenheit, well that means my junction uh, you know the transistor is at some temperature above that. But if I let my room go to ninety or ninety five degrees Fahrenheit, wow that's 20, 25 degrees Fahrenheit more. Where do we get in trouble with solid state devices like that? Well, that, that's a hard question to answer because it will vary from one manufacturer to the next, both for the devices and the equipment they're used in. I mean, for, for us, if, for example, we shut our amplifiers down at an 85 degrees Celsius heat sink temperature or somewhere in the ballpark of about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Um, you're well well into egg frying temperatures at that point. I've seen transmitters running hot enough that plastic bezels on meters were starting to melt and run down the front of the transmitter, and it would still make mm. power. Mm. Now, you're not doing anything for the lifespan at that point, but it continues to function. And this comes back to one of the 
don't know a tactful way to put it. One of the old saws we hear about tube transmitters is they'll run through anything. And yeah, they will run through anything, but you are shortening the lifespan of that thing while you're doing it. And I think we've all seen what happens to a, a, a tube socket, for example, if it sees 200 plus degrees for extended periods of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you really notice it when you take the tube out and little finger stock fingers start falling off because they got hot and brittle. And you realize, hmm, maybe I should have checked the back pressure on this thing or maybe I should have taken the temperature on the exhaust stack. So you're saying that uh, typically a, a Nautel transmitter anyway is, is programmed or designed to shut down above 190 Fahrenheit on the heat sink temperature. Is that what I heard you say? It, again, it varies. And I mean, I, I know Gates Air has uh, thermal shutdowns. I'm pretty sure. Shore, Rody, and Schwartz do to name the the big ones that I think of for FM off the top of my head. But uh, but uh, basically, we look at 85 degrees for the heat sink temperature. We look at a 50 degree ambient temperature. We look at 85 on the controller. So do, there are multiple things being monitored. And I mean, we'll do a graceful shutdown where we can, where we start switching off supplies or amplifiers as their individual temperature goes up. Uh, part of the theory behind that is if you have multiple fan failures, then you might only need to shut part of the transmitter off. Uh, you know, in our case, we'll also use variable speed fans and increase the cooling as we mm. start seeing the need for more more airflow. So uh, I've got a, a, a Nautel transmitter. I think it's two and a half kilowatt model. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we've had a fail. In fact, it's waiting on parts. Either either myself or another guest that's been on the show, Mike Patton. Whoever gets there first is gonna is gonna replace the uh, the amplifier board. But uh, and and a non technical person at our station talked to Nautel uh, support about the symptoms and what the things what was being read out. We we were not hooked up on the internet at that site, uh, so uh, they determined that a bad fan and a bad RF amplifier pallet. Uh, which which probably failed first? Did the fan fail first, and that led to the amplifier pallet failing, or would you have an, a notion about that? Uh, typically, I would guess that they'd probably be simultaneous. I mean, now the, the fan could theoretically fail, and the amplifier keep working. I mean, that that transmitter, especially if it's not connected to anything that's notifying you the alarms, mm -hmm. the fan could be failed for months. I mean, uh -huh. the amplifier would just sit there chugging along. You know, but uh, it will be running warmer, and uh, eventually you'd either hit the point of no return or you had a, another incident that uh, just tipped it over the edge, so to speak. So, well, yeah, I would well, suspect the fan first just because you would have no way of knowing if it was failed if you're not monitoring it. Well, the good news is our wireless ISP is uh, is uh, at, at th this month putting Internet at that site. So we're going to we'll be able to see all the parameters of the transmitter, not just the forward reflected power and and the the the, uh, the plate voltage, so to speak. Um, so what about see so that that was cool. What about clean? Uh, that seems kind of obvious. Well, because clean has an effect on on heat. If things are caked with dust, then heat can't escape. But wh why is clean important? That that is the biggest reason right there. Yeah. I mean, as you uh, start covering things with dirt, their ability to dissipate heat really really reduces. And I mean, a heat sink can lose something like fifty percent of its efficiency with a eighth inch layer of dust. Uh, it, it depends too on the dust. But the other thing to remember too is that dust can be conducive to arcing. And if you're dealing with a tube rig with high voltage components, then random flecks of dust floating around can be an issue sometimes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. So something else to consider. So definitely keeping the air as filtered as possible within reason is, is a really good idea. So uh, the f what, what kind of air filtration is usually needed? You, you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, if, if you have a closed system, a, a building that's just same air is going round and round, you don't have much you know, ingress of, of dust from the outside world. Oftentimes, you know, transmitters are, well, in the, in the South, uh, they're in the middle of a field, a bean field, a cotton field, uh, a, not in the middle of a rice paddy, hopefully, but, you know, there are places where uh, several times a year, tractors stir up a lot of dirt and dust and things like that. Uh, that's my situation. Now, my transmitters are all in places that get real dusty a couple of times a year. And I think I think now all of our transmitter sites are closed. So we've got a better situation there. Uh, what, what, uh, talk to me about, you know, a, a, a regimen of air filter changing. If you're, if you are blowing outside air into a building, uh, what does that look like in terms of 
the filters you ought to use? Should you use anything in a, you know on the transmitter in addition to what Nautel did? Or you know, kind of give me some rules of thumb there. All right. Well, number one, looking at the transmitter alone, I mean, we design it for sitting in a, a neutral environment where there's not a lot of dust coming into the building, you know, and theoretically you've got some positive air pressure and we'll touch on that in a sec. But uh, in my mythical perfect world, I would grab a couple of sheets of plywood and some two by fours and build a little four by four clean room on the back of my transmitter building. Put a set of filters on the intake to that with some intake fans and then a secondary set of uh, higher density, higher micron rated filters at the uh, input to the actual room. So you got a, a clean air room built out there. Cost you probably about $500 in parts in an afternoon. Um, hmm. So for folks that don't have the budget to do air conditioning, it's a really inexpensive way to improve the quality of the air going into the transmitter building. Um, Item number two is what I just mentioned, positive pressure. Bring more air in than you have to run through the equipment and more air going through the equipment than you let out of the room. So, for example, if I've got a transmitter with 1,000 CFM, 1,000 cubic feet per minute throughput on the airflow, bring 2,000 into the building, run it, run, pump it right into the back of the transmitter so it's all going through the transmitter and maybe thing less than 2,000 as long as we know we've got enough air through the transmitter. And the advantage to that where you're bringing more super filtered air in or more filtered air in, every crack and crevice in that building becomes an air exhaust. So it's pushing air out of the cracks and crevices and no dust comes in around the door. I've been to sites in the Caribbean, for example, where there'd be a quarter inch layer of salt for about five inches on the inside of the door frames. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, definitely the positive pressure is the way to go there, you know. Hey, uh, our last topic is going to be well-grounded, but before we switch to that topic, I, I want to mention, I, I think we've, we've mentioned it here on the show once before, uh, I, I had a lot of um, mental pushback to air, you know, closing a, a, a transmitter room and constantly air conditioning. I thought, well, that's got to just take a lot of tonnage of air conditioning to cool uh, a combination of tube and solid state transmitters in, in a big transmitter room. And then Mike Patton helped me do the calculations or at least a, a back of the napkin calculations on when you bring outside air in, especially if you're in a humid environment, you're also bringing in the latent heat of all the moisture in that outside air. So if you're bringing in perfectly dry air that's 95 degrees, that's a whole lot easier to cool off than if you're bringing in moisture-laden air that's even 85 or 90 degrees. That that moisture has a lot of latent heat right there. And so um, we did a calculation that showed us that in Mississippi, in the middle of a bean field, uh, it was only going to cost us about 15% more in electricity to close the building and air condition at 24-7, 365 because yep. of the addition of that factor of the latent heat of moist air coming in. And you better believe the air is moist in Mississippi. So. Right. And I mean, that's one of the things, you know, we, we've had the discussion in the, the air-cooled versus uh, liquid-cooled transmitter forum several times. And I say forum, you know, people bring it up and we'll get going on it. But mm -hmm. the actual... So, All right. I yeah. It, Mm -hmm. Definitely worthwhile. Now, the other thing to remember, too, is that your trans your air conditioner needs to be built right side up for broadcast. And there's the face I was looking for. So, uh -huh. okay, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to throw a name. Um, everybody's familiar with barred transmitters or barred air conditioners. Barred, yes. They're and, on the side of all the cell buildings, yes. Right. And they're a wonderful thing for offices or living spaces because they throw the cool air out up high and it settles down and keeps the room nicely cooled, and then they draw the right. return in at the bottom. Right. Think back to just about every transmitter you've ever looked at. Where's the air intake? It's bottom. at the bottom, usually at the rear. Where's the hot air come out? Up there. So yeah. now you've got the air conditioner pulling air away from the transmitter intakes and dumping the cooled air in where it just gets to mix with the already hot air coming from the transmitter. It, it's the least efficient way to air condition a transmitter. So if you do have one of those units, and, and they're not a bad air conditioner, just get some guy to spend a couple thousand dollars and some sheet metal, flip your top, your goes into it, and you 
so that the I, cool air comes out in the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. What about now? A, a lot of transmitters are rack mounted. The, the ones from Nautel that we happen to have are the smaller rack mounted ones. So they suck their air in the front typically, don't they? Uh, it will vary one transmitter to the next. Uh, ah. The VS300, the little 300 watt, sucks it in right behind the rack ears on the sides. But yeah, the one on the two mm -hmm. and a half, bring it in through the front and then just send it out through the rear. Let's uh, let's switch topics in the re re remaining time we have, and uh, and that is and, and that is grounding, grounding, uh, cool, clean, well grounded. Uh, this is where uh, the the uh, the paper in the back of Nautel manuals, and I'm sure it's available separately. In fact, we need to put a, a link to download it uh, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. But the talk to me about about what uh, uh, about grounding and what Nautel says about it, and I believe there's an interesting story about how Nautel did research on the right ways to, to ground for a transmitter. seems like you put, the, put up a couple of lightning collectors in a field somewhere in the Midwest and uh, see how they got hit by lightning. Maybe that's a wise time. Don't forget the ferrites. Don't forget the ferrites. Uh, well, oh, yeah. now ferrites, that's, that's my own personal <laughs> mantra right there. Uh, the grounding, I'm not familiar with that background story, but it okay. wouldn't surprise me. 90% of the things we find, we find after somebody blows it up in the field. So that that's real, you know, I mean, what's the easiest way to learn something, blow it up and then figure out how not to blow it up again. So, uh, of course that goes to 90% of all engineering anywhere. But the big thing that we beat the drum on, on grounding or that I beat the drum on, especially is that if you're putting new gear into an existing facility, it's almost easier in the long haul to rip the old ground system out. Because if you start laying things over top, you can't stop a lightning strike. I mean, there are folks that will sell things that say, yeah, we stop lightning. And it's, I don't think so. I haven't seen anything, any physical or scientific evidence that says you can stop lightning. But what you can do, because it's voltage divider theory, is help direct where it goes by providing a low inductance, low impedance path where you want it to go and making the path you don't want it to go a higher impedance. And okay, so that's, uh, that, that's that. Well, that, that we'll, we'll do the ferrites. Is that that's key? And I know you and Chris want to talk about that. I want to hear about that too. <laughs> but you said create a low inductance, low impedance path for the lightning, and I would assume that that path doesn't in, need to include the, the transmitter or any of your expensive gear in in the building. And this this document that Nautel has gives this great example of a tower. And a feed line coming in from the tower, of course, it's, you know, it's got a copper outer conductor, so it's lo lots of easy place for lightning to come in. And it goes in the building, and it goes into the transmitter, and then coming out of the transmitter on the other side of the transmitter uh, are the, the AC power lines that go to the, to the breaker box or the disconnect box, and those go to the power company out the other side of the building. So there's this huge sink this place that lightning would love to go down the power lines because they're an easy target uh and what's in the middle of that well this this huge 50 or hundred thousand dollar fuse called a transmitter and and <laughs> that's what we that's what we don't want to do and so not well, in in your manual you you actually uh, supply some ideas on how to correct that situation which is all too common when people build a, a transmitter building they run the power in from the road they build the transmitter building the towers on the other side of the uh of, of the building and so what's between those two your expensive mm -hmm. transmitter so you got some ideas right. on on how to fix that well one of the things you can do electrically speaking is move the transmitter off to the side of that path so put a surge protector an mov or a uh, silicon avalanche diode surge protector in directional so if you get a strike on the tower it's going to try and after it spikes ground potential way high it's going to try and dissipate and the power line's the best place to go um, i probably should have sat about five feet further from the webcam so you can see the hands going around as i demonstrate <laughs> illustrate but uh but the um, surge protector on its own is probably the single most critical thing beyond good grounding that you can have in a transmitter site and it is bi-directional, so a tower strike will dissipate on the AC lines as the surge protector as the devices clamp, or a power surge will dissipate to ground through the surge protector. Uh, at that point, you take the cables going from the transmitter, the AC and the RF cables, throw something on them to increase the impedance to them, and the surge protector becomes your path. 
So uh, like I say, we just take our transmitter and move it to the side, so to speak. Chris, you and Jeff, why don't you uh, jam a little bit on, on ferrites? I'm going to listen and learn. Oh, let, Jeff does a much better job than I would, and he's done it in many of his presentations. And I've uh, I've been using ferrites for a long time for many projects, both RF and for data lines. But uh, Jeff's Jeff's way of t talking about it and describing it is much better than I would do. Take it away. Well, I'm, I'm, the short description of a ferrite: it's a chunk of carbon, iron, and epoxy formed into a ring. And if you've got a feed and a return going through the ring, then as long as they've got the same amount of current on them. They're, the ferrite's neutral. It does absolutely nothing. But if you get a surge on one or the other, the ferrite will saturate and in the process of saturating, induce an equal surge on the other line so the potential difference stays the same. And the transmitter doesn't care whether it's looking at uh, 0 volts to 100 volts or 5,000 volts to 5,100 volts. So that that's one big purpose of a ferrite. Now, anybody who's done any ham radio stuff has probably built a choke at one point or another and round a piece of wire around a ferrite and choke out a high frequency. It also serves that purpose. Uh, what you got to remember is that lightning contains several components. It's got a fast rise time in the in the order of a couple of minutes. Well, we're having a hard time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, th there's been some times, uh, Jeff, when your signal's gone out, uh, hard time getting the packets to and to from uh, your... Uh, your, your home location there. But they're back now. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Well, we're in the middle of a, a ferocious windstorm here, so uh, I'm surprised that we're actually connected at all and the power <laughs> stayed on. But uh, so anyway, the ferrites, um, the, the, the big deal with them is that they do create an impedance to the high frequency component of a lightning strike. And the, the thing to remember, the lightning strike contains all of the components that our systems are designed to pass. You know, the uh, analog, uh, well, audio frequencies, they've got a decay in the 25 kilohertz range. They'll have a ring as the tune circuit, the antenna rings when it uh, when it gets hit with the massive current. So the, you've got, uh, this, like I say, everything our system is designed to pass on that lightning strike. And so the ferrites will help us to uh, block that from the transmitter as long as we provide a low impedance path through a surge protector or to the I guess that wind is really wh whipping up there. So, uh, Chris, um, uh, it sounds like we, what we want to do is create that low impedance path for the lightning to travel, not to the transmitter. And we want to create impedance using ferrites around cables and, and power cables and, and, uh, and RF cables to create impedance. It says, hey, don't come here, but look, there's that easy path over there. Is that right? That's pretty much in the simplest terms, yeah. Yeah, anyone who has a Nortel transmitter knows that you've got a, uh, a ferrite ring on your transmission line output. So, And I've used them on uh, repeater cabinets in a couple of oh. places, and people are like, I'm nuts. And I was like, well, my repeater is still working. I don't know what happened to yours. So I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey uh, we got to take a break here real soon. Uh, Chris, uh, in, 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 if you would, though, uh, one thing I, I wonder about, and if you can, we ought to spend a whole topic on this one day, but maybe you could tease us a bit. You do some work on some really tall buildings in New York City, and I would imagine you know the, the ground itself. I think of as hey, it's eighty stories down down there. You know, it's it, it's a long physical ways. I would think there'd be uh, what what well, are are ferrites a, a, a darn good idea when you're on top of a skyscraper for keeping lightning and surges out of equipment? Well, yeah, I mean, you still could use should you still use them. Is it is it a chance for lightning to hit a building rooftop? Absolutely. Um, is it possible that work being on on the superstructure on the rooftop where your antennas are mounted could have a problem because of other things around it? Sure. It's it's an insurance policy. Let's call it that. I mean, if you want to be picky and say, well, I don't need ferrets. I'm on top of a building. You know, like I've done work on the One World Trade Center, and people would say, well, why do we need to put a ferret on the output of the transmit on the 90th floor? Well, you know what? It doesn't hurt. Does it? How much is it going to cost you? Just, just do it just in case because it's 1,700 feet up into the air. There's a good chance low cloud cover. Maybe the difference of potential between the, the earth and the sky and the air in between the dielectric that collapses. There's a possibility that small mast on top of the building might act as a conduit. Don't know if you, you know, it may not be true. It may not happen today. It might happen tomorrow. Or you could always mm -hmm. think of it like the 100 year storm, you know? Wow. I, I'd say just. Yeah, don't don't go with the, path, the thinking of well, it's here and there. I don't need to do it. I could get away with it. No, just good engineering practice. Be practical about it, and uh, you know that's the way to do it.
Hey, uh, we're going to take a quick break. At the end of our show, uh, we're going to come back. Chris Tobin will have a tip of the week for us. Also, we're going to wrangle Jeff Welton into coming up with a tip of the week for us as well. Might have to do with uh, cool, clean, and well-grounded. But maybe he'll go beyond that. So hang on. We're going to have that. Our show brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk. Let's hear from Lavo. We'll be right back. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks so much to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And when you go to their website, be sure you hit the slash twert there. It'll take you right to their radio products, and it will let you know that we sent you, or at least you heard about it here. Not that, not that we sent you. You can make up your own mind. All right. At the end of our show, episode 421, and Jeff Welton has a tip for us. He's been giving us a lot of tips. Cool, clean, well-grounded. You know, that sounds like good advice for life. But you probably have something else for us as far as a tip, Jeff. Well, more and more as we get more and more into this IT-connected world, change your default usernames and passwords. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is excellent advice. Um, I th I think I usually do that. Yeah, I do. I do. Except there's one place I can think of where I've got user default usernames and passwords. I probably ought to fix that. Uh, because if you go on the internet to showdan.io, it's not a secret, and you do a search on you know name some broadcast equipment that might be have that might have an internet connection, uh, you'll find some out there just happily waving its arms on the internet. Hey, hey. And uh, dangerous from that point of view, but impossibly dangerous if you just have the default username and password on there. Good advice. Right on. Right on. Chris Tobin, how about you? Uh, default uh, password, and password? Pound, password hashtag one, two, three, four. It works every time. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Uppercase P. A -S -S. <laughs> Chris's tip of the week is uh, which password should we use? Chris, go ahead. Oh, my goodness. The places I've been to recently and I try out the uh, – oh, what's your router? Okay, let me try the router. Oh, look at that. Default password to get into the router at the very, very big place. Okay, good. Oh, have some fun. Wow. Oh, wow. Yes, yes, yes. I do do it with a laptop that's been scrubbed so I don't have to worry about any identifying material on it. Anyway, the tips of the week. Uh, recently doing some work – tearing apart, uh, dismantling, and moving out a Harris Diamond CD uh, ATSC transmitter a couple of weeks ago and we taking it apart and shipping it down the freight elevator and moving it out. One of the things you should, one of the things you should always consider when working on equipment, safety glasses. Ooh. Now, you can get the ones that are like, like goggles and you look like you're welding, or you can get the stylish type, you know, like these. But at least they're OSHA and they're, they're good to have, and it's important, trust me. And proper uh, hand materials, like gloves, uh, certain types of gloves that are handy. Uh, it comes in handy, trust me. Working on a transmitter uh, of any kind, 
tubes, solid state, and you're pulling modules out and pulling off the plumbing, the RF plumbing, opening cabinet doors, uh, you will get dust and dirt flying out of things. And uh, these guys do help eliminate or minimize the impact on you. And there's something else very simple to leave at the transmitter site for a regular, for a rainy day, an umbrella. Recently working with a friend at, at a building, and we, we got wind, wind no pun intended, but the rain started. The, the rain, for, the forecast didn't call for it, but suddenly there was a storm passing through. And he's like, what am I going to do? I don't have an umbrella. I said, I don't have to tell you. I've got mine right here next to the transmitter. So uh, just you know, think, think out of the box. Think of what should I leave with the transmitter site for those nights or days where I might be out there unexpectedly or planned, and I should have stuff I need. How many people, how many of you carried those little batteries around for your phone so you, you, you stay charged? Mm-hmm. You're yeah. a transmitter site. You've got power. Maybe leave an extra charger and c- cable in the in the toolbox. Yeah. So you don't have to yeah, carry these lug yeah. it around. You know, little things like that. Just think about it. It makes sense. So those are those are the tips for today. Guys, we got to go. Good tips, Chris. And the, the show notes today are going to be copious. Uh, we got a lot of good show notes in there. Jeff Welton, thank you so much for braving a windstorm. Thanks for most. You know, ninety eight percent of the packets have gotten have gotten here. So appreciate that. Thank you. Have you me. It's it's good to see you and congratulations from from all of us on uh, being the educator of the year and now now we'll expect even more from you yeah oh yeah <laughs> raised the bar there didn't you raised the bar that's right that's right all right good to see you. hey Chris Tobin good to see you I'm glad you made it and uh, we'll see you next week okay. Absolutely. And I just got to say, Jeff, congratulations. It's always good to see you and, and talk to you. And I have to shout out to two people up there in the uh, Toronto area and uh, uh, Dave Simons and, and, and Wally Lennox. Dave, I'm sorry. I just found out that one of your emails came to me and it's stuck in my spam folder. I didn't, I got new service and a lot of people's uh, mail email went to spam for some reason. So I'm not sure what the new keywords are. They're siphoning out, but I'll reach out to you guys next week for those questions you had. So I just had to apologize for that. I know there's several other folks that have sent me stuff. I just discovered uh, this morning. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, new email service and things that I get normally, it just suddenly get boop, sent off to the spam. Well, the, the, the new service hasn't yet learned which people's emails you'll put up with. So there you go. That's true. That's true. But those two guys I have more than more than <laughs> willing to talk with and happy. To have, of course. Of course. They're terrific guys. I know them Those both. are good guys. They're, they're good guys. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, next week on This Week in Radio Tech, we're going to have a real expert on streaming. I mean, a technical expert, Sam Sosa from, uh, not that Sam Sosa, the other Sam Sosa, Sam Sosa from Triton. uh, And uh, he's going to be with us, and it's going to be a really good show. I can't wait to have Sam on. We've been, uh, we had to schedule him months in advance because the dude is busy. So that, that'll be uh, next time. Hey, I want to shout a big uh, thanks to Suncast for uh, putting up with my uh, lack of prep. So appreciate that. Thanks uh, very much, of course, to, to Jeff and to Chris. And thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of great podcasts. And you can even, oh, let me get the mic out of the way. You can even, you know, find these shirts. Get it? GFQ, like Subway. There you go. Yeah. Cost more than twenty bucks to get that. Yeah, it, yeah, it costs a lot to get there. Long, long subway ride. <laughs> yeah, you got to take the G and the F and the Q to get there. <laughs> well, we're gonna go. We'll see you next week on this week in Radio Tech. Bye, bye, everybody. Mm-hmm.